Hello, everybody. Welcome to Super Science Virtual Summits. Uh, this is the first session of the day, obviously, and I am personally just grateful that all the housekeeping has been taken care of, so we can just dive right into that. Uh, quick intro, so I'm Miles DePaul. I lead demand generation here at SuperSide. Um, and we're just so happy that you've all joined us live. Joining me today, uh, we have Jessica Gelzer. Jessica is the Senior Director of Brand Marketing at Curative. Uh, we also have Nolan McCoy, the Head of Video and Creative Content at Chili Piper. And last, certainly not least, is uh, Nina Kaplan, the VP of Video Services at SuperSide. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so I think the only housekeeping piece will just be Q and A. So we we do we'll, we only have thirty minutes here today to talk through uh, today's subject, which is all about how to scale your video strategy, pursuing an in-house versus an outs outsourcing strategy. We definitely have some topics we want to dive into around how to get started, how to scale your video strategy, but we also want to hear from all of you and I'll be uh, taking notes throughout this to make sure I can capture some thoughts. So within Hopin, you should have a good Q&A function to be able to, to jump in and join the conversation. Uh, but yeah, to get started, maybe a good way to introduce all of you individually um, would just be a first question to get to, to know all of you and really how you think about video marketing at, at your companies right now. Um, so first I'll go to you, Jessica, then maybe we'll go to Nolan after that, but tell us a little bit about your role at Curative and what are some of the ways that you currently use video and what are some of your goals around video right now, just to get the conversation started? Definitely. Yes. I'm Jessica, Senior Director of Brand Marketing at Curative and just some context of what Curative is. Um, we initially were the nation's large, uh, in the U.S., the nation's largest uh, testing uh, COVID-19 testing company, um, not a sustainable business model. So we took that money that we earned and uh, essentially bootstrapped a health insurance plan. And I see people are here from all over the world. Um, and uh, so this may not be no novel, but or it may come as a surprise, but the majority of our health insurance comes from our employers. And when people go into the doctor's office, they don't know how much it's gonna cost. They could be hospitalized and be footed with thousand dollar bills. Um, and so what Curative does is an employer-based health insurance plan um, that has no co-pays and no deductibles, just a monthly premium. And um, so what we, because it's employer-based, the majority of our video is B2B, but we, uh, and is focused on sales um, and then their onboarding and management. Um, but we do about 30% D to C partially to do a grassroots movement um, to encourage consumers to ask their employers. Um, but also once they're enrolled into the plan, uh, help engage them as members and increase brand loyalty and member engagement. Um, aside from that, we use video as thought leadership and general brand awareness. Um, and we've been able to do that as a fairly younger company. We've only had members on for uh, six months now. Um, we've been able to do that uh, through outsourcing and we'll talk about that soon. Exactly, perfect. Yeah, and Nolan, I'd love to hear a little bit about you because I know you take a bit more of the in-house side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me. I'm excited to be here. My name is Nolan. Uh, like Miles said, I'm the head of video and creative content at a company called Chili Piper. We are a B2B uh, scheduling and lead routing tool that helps double inbound conversion rates. We put a little bit of code behind your existing web form and allow your prospects to uh, instantly schedule with the right rep and help plug up your funnel. Make sure nobody's slipping through the cracks and uh, you can attribute those meetings to revenue. And uh, the way we're using video at Chili Piper is we are um, using it, of course, for top of funnel brand awareness. We do lots of crazy things on social, on LinkedIn, primarily is where we find our audience. But we also do some thought leadership content on YouTube. We produce a demand generation podcast called Demand Gen Chat, which is a video and audio podcast. And then we're on Instagram, TikTok, all the things we've, uh, TikTok's a different topic, but uh, we've experimented <laughs> with lots of different channels and, uh, yeah, we just use it as a tool to reach our audience and hopefully can help a lot of the people here today do the same. Perfect, and Nina, do you mind just sharing a bit about yourself as well? Sure, so uh, my role now, so 
as VP of Video Services at Superside, I have the pleasure of working with a, a wide variety of, of customers um, with varied goals within video. And we, we support them with a service that adapts to whatever it is that they need within video to meet those goals. Um, so it's pretty broad at the moment, but in my previous lives, um, I've worked in-house at a couple of content-led consumer brands. So I had the pleasure of 13 wonderful years at Red Bull, um, where you know, we were using media content, predominantly video, to build this sort of very unique image-driven Red Bull brand world um, to bring to life the, the, the Red Bull Gives You Wings proposition. Um, and then latterly, I joined Zwift, which is a virtual cycling app. Uh, with a, a fiercely loyal and active community of users. And there we built an in-house production unit um, to service and engage those users with, with live racing content, with weekly shows, with podcasts, with brand films, social content. So, so I've seen it from both sides. Um, I've been in-house producing, I've used a hybrid model and now I'm on the super side side. So I'm, I'm excited to get into the chat and discuss the, the pros and cons of all of them. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like what I really want to get started with, um, I'm not sure what the audience split is right now, but there's definitely when we talk to a, a lot of companies, they're either thinking about like getting started with video or like going beyond, you know, getting started beyond just you know, webinars or, or some, um, some basic video strategy and looking at like getting started in earnest, like building a, a repeatable video strategy. So I kind of want to start there and then we can talk about how to actually scale that. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll go to you first, Nolan. You, I think a lot of our audience, as I said today, is really at the point of getting started with video, don't really know where to get started. Uh, so when you were in the early stages, thinking through Chili Piper strategy, or really in any of your experience with video, how do you get started with, with video? And I guess specifically for you, when it comes to deciding to build that in-house, like what were some of the considerations you took, you took when it came to how do we build a scalable video strategy in-house rather than relying on external partners? Yeah, absolutely. I think without sounding too oversimplistic, it really is starting with why. Why do you want to do video? What What's the purpose that you're trying to fill with it? Uh, I see a lot of people kind of put video as like a silver bullet or if we make video, then they'll come and we'll double our sales and it'll be amazing. But um, I, I think it really is a processed approach of why do you want to make video? And then how are you going to make video and what are you going to make video about? and identifying those three themes first and foremost, because that's gonna help clarify the content that you're actually gonna make and put your best efforts into it. Uh, when I joined Chili Piper, uh, I joined onto the marketing team and I was hired as an in-house video role to fill that need. And really our, our first uh, thing that we're trying to solve was brand awareness. And so that meant we were moving fast, kind of quick and dirty with video, just making stuff kind of quantity over quality to just fill the feed with lots of different interesting video content pieces. And then as we've evolved and I've been at Chili Piper now over two and a half years, we've kind of matured that approach a little bit into those thought leadership streams. We still do some of the weird stuff, like I said before, but we're, we're, we're kind of diversifying that video content across the channels as we figure out where our audience is and what content they're consuming. We're very data driven, especially on the YouTube side of what's performing, what's that click through rate looking like. And we could get into some success metrics later, but really if, if you're looking to start with video in house, um, yeah, just understand that you need to know why and how and what you're going to do because it's not just make a video and then you'll find success. It's actually in that, that pre process that often gets forgotten that will really set you up for the win. Yeah, exactly. And I, I've encountered this before where it's like, okay, let's get started with video. And then you think about all the different things you got to you know, buy first and foremost, lighting, microphones, the, obviously the right camera and everything. I think there's a lot that you can do with just a cell phone now. And I imagine that's a great place to start. Um, but if you really want to like, I guess, make a splash and Jessica over to you now, um, you know, as you're thinking through this thought leadership content, a lot of your, the, the video content that you mentioned curative uh, has done started over the last year. Uh, you made the decision to go outsourced. And so when you were getting started with, with your video strategy, um, what led to that decision? What were some of your considerations when you're thinking about, like, can we build this in-house? Can we build this internally? Do we have the resources? Or is actually there a partner out there that could help us uh, accomplish the strategy while maintaining our brand voice and everything else that's important to you? Yeah, definitely. So as a very young company, we... 
um, have to prove the ROI of video before investing internally in it. Um, we're a pretty lean staff um, and uh, keeping it that way as we um, build out our uh, brand new product. So um, it, it kind of was an obvious choice to outsource. Um, but the way we dipped our toe into it um, was actually using stock video. We needed something quick um, and uh, we were already working with SuperSide on the graphic design side. So decided to partner with them on their video offerings um, as they already knew our brand voice and, um, and style. So uh, yeah, outsourcing in general, it, it felt like the only option, um, at least when it came to more produced content for the B2B audience that we were trying to reach. Um, I mean, I uh, even before we got started with video, I, we were getting ideas from every department saying, let's do a video for this, let's do a video for that. So there, there's no shortage of ideas um, and needs for video, um, whether it's explainers or awareness or testimonials or um, product demonstrations or FAQs, there's, there's endless need for video. So it's a matter of prioritizing it, um, then testing it, um, and really making sure that when you do invest in video, you have a relevant distribution strategy to reach your customers. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say um, we were able to do that um, outsourced. It was a, a matter of resources, of cost, and um, m more so than cost of value. Yeah, perfect. And you know, like I, you've been on both sides of the fence, I guess, just in-house outsourcing. I know a lot of like supersized customers that you work with are probably just getting started with video, similar to what Jessica was saying, where you know we might know their brand voice already. Um, but I guess I'm I'm curious, like how you what what are some of the recommendations you'd make for for companies that are thinking about getting started, and then how you um, navigate that in-house versus outsource decision. And then I think really interestingly, a topic that comes up often is how those can actually work in unison. So you could certainly have an in-house team with an outsource team. Uh, but I think it's important for those to be you know, unified and for there to be strong collaboration between those two. So I guess, yeah, yeah. question over to you would be just how do you uh, how do you propose recommendations to different companies that are thinking about getting started with video right now? Yeah, I think like you say, it, <clears throat> it kind of depends on like um, the the status of that company and where they are with with video and what and what resources that they have available to dedicate to it. So uh, there's definitely a hybrid approach that I think that can work. You know, it's kind of in between the strategies that Nolan and Jessica were talking about. Um, you know, at, at Red Bull, we, um, we kind of ran it like that. You know, we organized ourselves almost like a media network and, and the function of the in-house team when it came to video was largely that of a kind of commissioning function. So we had in-house producers and channel managers who knew their channels um, and knew what would work on them, knew the brand. We had some writers and content creators in-house, but the majority of the video work was actually shot and edited externally by production partners. And that, you know, that, that sort of um, split of owning ideation, concepting, um, how the brand is managed in-house, and then the actual physical shooting and editing out of house sort of allows you access to, a, a, if you need it, if your company is in that state, you know, a much broader set of expertise, you know, if you're, I think if you're an earlier stage company, you know, when we talk about curative, then, you know, the, the ability to sort of jump into many of these need states that Jessica talked about, th then outsourcing is a really good place to start because you can test them. You can test multiple kind of formats, see how, see what works, which you can do to a certain degree in-house, but if you're just a team of one or two in-house to start with, it's, it's harder to do that. So I think it really depends on like where you are, like the maturity of the company, the, the resources that you have internally. Um, and, you know, if you're, in a, if you're in a position where you have a relatively well-developed brand and you know what you want to achieve, then that hybrid model of like 
retaining control in-house, but then upscaling your um, your service out, out of house, it can complement what you've got going on. If, you, if you're really smashing it in the UGC space, but you want to move into brand-driven narrative content or film customer testimonials, you can try those with an external provider whilst not taking your foot off the gas with the other strands of content that you already have going. So it can afford you a little bit more flexibility of um, trialing new formats. And when I joined Superside, you know, that was, we started shaping the video offering and tried to take learnings from that so that we could create a modular service that can play really well in that hybrid space. So we meet the customer where they are, depending on what, what their needs are. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. We're getting a couple questions. So thanks everybody for that. I think there's a, a theme kind of around uh, like ROI, especially when it comes to, to outsourcing. And it, I imagine this applies to, to in-housing as well, but you know, justifying return on investment. The question from Monica, really good question about how do you go about determining ROI for video to justify outsourcing? I think the same applies to in-housing too, like go about investing in the equipment, investing in maybe a dedicated person to be involved in video production. Uh, when there might not be that immediate payoff, I think things like video advertising is maybe where you can start to clearly see the ROI. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump to you, Nolan, just to get started on this, this question. Like, how do you go about uh, measuring ROI and then also like communicating that to, to whoever holds the budget for this decision? Yeah. So obviously you want to start at your campaign level, right? So what are the goals of this campaign that you're using video to try and drive those results? So, um, you know, video at times can be hard to attribute. Like, I'll just be honest, like it, it can be hard to track, like how did watching that video over here, you know, then they went over here and they read that and then they came inbound and then they, you know, purchased your thing or called you. But, um, you know, it, it, looking at like retention metrics is a really great, you know, place to start to see, are they even watching the content all the way through? Because if they're only watching 10 seconds of a video, they're probably not also buying your product, right? So it's making engaging content. And I think it goes back to the where to start is I think just becoming a really great storyteller. And I know this is kind of adjacent to the question, but like starting with invoking human emotions and people relating to your content because then you're going to see that uptick in conversions or in sales because you're not just, again, making a thing to make a thing. You're actually making a thing that actually is reaching someone personally. Um, so then actually looking at those metrics and seeing like, okay, did they watch the whole video? What did they do after they watched the whole video? Did they watch another one? Or did they then, you know, take a demo or did they, you know, sign up for the newsletter? Or um, us, we, we look at those kind of top of funnel metrics. We'll look at, you know, what did they do after that they subscribe? Did they sign up for our customer newsletter? Did they, um, you know, take a demo? Did they, you know, reach out on another channel that, you know, uh, isn't as trackable? But yeah, it's it's always not easy to, to attribute, like I said, video to, to conversions. But um, often if you have like a self-reported attribution form on your site and there's a little field to say, you know, how did you hear about us? Oftentimes that's a great place to to track that because somebody will say, oh, I saw a video or I listened to a podcast or I did a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And a similar question to you, Jessica, because I know, you know, obviously, uh, I guess you have referred to your team as pretty lean, pretty small. And there's a few people in the comments talking about that as well. Like there's, you know, frankly, the, the Red Bull video strategy, which is probably, you know, top of the top in terms of like a whole media company behind it. And then those just getting started and really having to justify it. So how did you go about, I guess, thinking through the the ROI, or I think somebody called it the return on influence, not return on investment, uh, but the ROI of video, and then also the ROI of working with an external partner to actually deliver that? Yeah, I would say um, this relates to making sure there's a relevant um, distribution strategy for it, and that you have the dollars to do so. So um, we weren't able to measure it at first we were just creating it for organic content for like sales meetings for um, sales presentation uh, like conferences things like that um, but once we started investing in the ads we uh, really saw um, our our click through our uh, cost per click um, being incredibly low uh, compared to the benchmark at four cents a click so that's, you can't get much better than that. Um, and so that that was the most numerical way that we know it's working. 
Um, but I think like other items, uh, there there is no perfect answer, honestly, on this one. Uh, if you're doing more brand awareness, um, we could look at on social channels, how much it's been uh, shared. So um, a lot of our, our like brand story videos have done very well on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, it, it's mostly about measuring through whichever channels you're distributing it on. Um, but there, and, and some of some of the measurement has to just be anecdotal, uh, qualitative evidence, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I want to move a bit towards scaling your video strategy. And I think that can mean all sorts of different things. Um, picking up on some of the, the Q&A we have, I think a lot of people are thinking about scaling when it comes to prioritizing quality over quantity, for instance, prioritizing speed. Um, you know, staying on top of trends is a big one. That's, uh, I think Marjorie was asking about just how you stay on top of trends, which I think is about, you know, it's not producing a video a month. It's actually being, you know, almost topical in, in the moment. Um, so, so maybe over to you, Nina, just thinking about how, how you think about scaling a video strategy to be able to, for instance, maintain quality, uh, of video, but you also want to be able to move fast and also keep up with kind of the trends of what that the platforms are almost prioritizing. There's uh, definitely a, a movement towards almost lower quality or like seemingly lower quality video. Um, so when you're thinking working with customers, how do you think about quality over quantity, speed, and just generally how to scale your video strategy as a, as a company? Yeah, I, I think, you know, once again, it comes back to the, to the goals that, that that company's trying to achieve. And I, I think if you're talking about kind of broader brand awareness, and positioning, then there's an argument for quality over quantity of trying to deliver messages in a in a well thought through, well told way, well crafted way. Um, but I think increasingly in this, you know, what, what's demanded of, of brands and companies this day this day and age in in the sort of platform driven culture is is that speed and frequency and relevance of just showing up in the right places. And that's when you do have to let go a little bit of the um, production value, you know, it, that doesn't necessarily sit as well in YouTube shorts and TikTok and, and things like that. That's not how the audience is consuming the content in those, in, those, um, in those places. So I think you have to adapt, you know, if your audience is in those places and you want to be influencing them on a regular basis, those platforms are rewarding relevancy and speed and frequency. So you just have to find a way to be able to show up at lower cost, you know, produce 15 videos for the cost of what you would have spent on one longer brand narrative piece that would have done a job on a different platform. Those are the choices that I think you need to, you need to make. And, and that's where a partner can help or an in-house team could be, you know, back to Nolan's point of like knowing why you're doing video and what you're showing up to do. You just have to be super clear on what you're trying to achieve with it. Yeah, absolutely. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Like, maybe I'll go to you, Nolan, because I know you've uh, you've kind of approached this very almost as a part of your campaign at Chili Piper, taking like a I, I guess I forget what you call it, but if you want to speak to how you've approached more of the um, yeah quality versus uh, quantity, and especially just how you've been able been able to scale that on your social channels over time. Yeah, I think to the to the quantity over quality thing you know one of the benefits that did come out of covid was that a lot of production did go virtual and a lot of things kind of went we also saw the rise of TikTok and at the same time and i think what it did is it really kind of leveled the playing field a little bit because we all realized that we all have one of these right and that all films pretty good video and it allowed everyone to kind of be democratized to make their own content and um I'm often finding that I'm producing effective content on my phone and uh, I'm not leaning on some of the tools that I was leaning on before to, you know, I, I come from like production background. I'm like Adobe Premiere and After Effects and all these things. And I'm finding a lot more lighter weight tools that are cheaper and allowing me to move quicker with the help of AI stuff now coming up into those tools as well. And I really do think that there is a time and a place for 
a high quality video. Like I'm a team of one in house at Chili Piper and we do outsource and we do go to agencies to, you know, we worked with a, an agency to help produce our explainer video. Right. And that was something where my role became a liaison between teams, right? I'm kind of project managing our team and working with, you know, an agency and there's a time and a place for it. But when you are trying to kind of be a little scrappy and use video to kind of achieve some of those goals, I do think that, you know, there is a kind of quality over quantity and we think of video as this big production Hollywood. Let's, you know, we got to over almost overthink it, but really it, it, it can be as simple as your phone and a good idea back to again, the why, the what, and the how it's like, it doesn't have to be a, a movie production to make people feel something and making people feel something is what's going to make them take an action that you want them to. Amazing. And I, we literally have one minute left. So I, I think the, maybe the transition to the next session, um, it might be for you, Nina, just cause I know you think about this a lot. Trey had a good question about uh, where you see video content and marketing going in the coming future with AR and VR, uh, I guess, changing, potentially changing how we interact with, um, with brands. But I think just in general, like the, the future of video, are there trends that you're paying attention to that you want to stay on top of, uh, or that companies you work with are, are paying attention to any recommendations for the audience on, yeah, staying on top of upcoming trends? Um, I, yeah, I mean, AR and VR, I think that just that layer of like, interaction and um, interactivity that you can you can add to video content is like an incredible playing field for like where we can go with video and how we can bring these these kind of concepts together and do new things whether it be like more immersive experiences in like your favorite sports or like you know just from a marketing perspective how you can allow people to engage and um be part of what your product or your experience or your event is. I just think there's there's in, incredible, incredible opportunities there. Um, I think in general, like where the future's going, I, I mean, like I'm sure this is gonna come a million times in this summit, but how AI will will impact how how quickly and how creatively um, content is 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 produced and what we can do now that used to take days and weeks and months that can now take literally seconds in a in an AI tool is is incredible and that and it's power that we can harness to just create better stuff it's not coming for jobs it's it's like just making things 10 times better and there's you know there's a million more things but um we're completely out of time <laughs> but this has been so much fun <laughs> i know that that flew by there's a million questions in the chat thank you so much for that uh we're definitely we'll we'll try to find ways to answer those maybe there's a longer session we could do at some point in the future a webinar or something like that um, but this was a, a good segue into our, our next topic. So I will just say, first of all, thank you to Jessica, Nolan, Nina for joining us today, sharing some of your thoughts, your experiences. Uh, and I think right away we're rolling over to our next session. So. Yeah.